So thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I'm sorry I'll be speaking in English, but of course we have this fantastic simultaneous uh, translation, so um, that'll make up for it. Uh, so what I'm going to speak about today for about 20 minutes or so is um, advanced technology for learning in the classroom, and specifically technology that leverages um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and sort of to give you a flavor for the state of the art um, in, in this area. Um, but before uh, talking about the technology, I want to give a little bit of back, backdrop. Um, maybe this is preaching to the choir, as we say, for some of you who, are, who know this about education, but it provides a good backdrop for the work. That is that the <clears throat> reality of uh, education is that class sizes are, are growing, teachers are, can be overwhelmed by this growth, and at the same time, kids are growing up with technology. So they're used to using technology um, in all facets of their life, and they expect to use technology um, in their education and their learning too, and they expect it to be good, which is one reason why we're, we look to advanced technology such as AI and machine learning to help us in developing that technology. So a, a question to ask is, will, will advanced learning technology be the panacea for, for education? I think that's a very open, open question, but surely we're moving towards having more and more technology in the classroom. Um, the other point to make is that certainly there's a lot of money that's being put into technology. Uh, the, the graphs that I show here, the graph at the top, shows the, the growth at 7% from 2012 to 2015, and then again from 2015 to 2017 of 7%, and that's content, that's, has continued to today, and it probably will continue. There's more and more money that's being put into technologies, and to support the idea of needing advanced technologies, things like social, um, social um, communities and um, serious gaming are areas of big growth where a lot of um, this funding is being put, to build um, te advanced technologies. So um, again, to give a little bit of a backdrop, and many of you uh, probably know about uh, the field called the learning sciences, but it's a relatively new field, um, and it basically is the field that underlies a lot of the work that's being done with advanced technology, and it brings together, as you can see, these various fields, um, traditional fields um, that have been separate, but now they're sort of brought together and it's very multidisciplinary, and all these fields are very important to the learning sciences because we need to understand how um, students learn, but at the same time, we need to um, understand enough about technology to, to know what's the right level of technology and how to bring technology to bear for student learning. Um, the learning sciences brings, of course, a lot of theory um, to, to learning. Many of you, I'm sure, know about uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. Um, theory and it's very important um, for a lot of advanced learning technology because the idea is that you have to find the right sort of sweet spot of what students need um, in, in their learning in order to provide technology that's going to, to um, support them. Um, the, the theory of course predates technology by quite a bit um, but, but it's really relevant in today's um, building of technology because the idea is that we want to be adaptive to students. We want to be able to know where their zone of proximal development is, where it is that students have some prior knowledge, but in order for them to advance, they, um, we need to give them the right sort of um, support and feedback, um, and we need to know what they know and where we can take them. And so it's a very important underlying theory for, um, for advanced technology. And um, to provide the assistance to, to to students. There's been some work um, actually by two colleagues of mine at Carnegie Mellon, um, Ken Kadinger and Vincent Alevin, where they posed what they called the assistance dilemma. So it's one thing to know that a student needs help and, and to be able to do that in sort of an automated fashion with technology, but um, it's another thing to know how much assistance is, um, is the right amount of assistance to give to a student. And it's not an easy question to answer. And so this simple matrix sort of summarizes uh, what, what people are trying to do in providing assistance in technology um, and supporting students. So for instance, giving assistance has the benefit of maybe guiding a student so they waste less time, but it could come at the cost of if you guide them too much, then there, there might be shallow processing of, of, what, of the information and the, and the content that you're giving them. On the other hand, 
if you let a student um, work without getting too much assistance, they may work harder, they may um, have generative processing, um, which could engage their long-term memory, but the cost could be that they'll flounder. So this is not an easy question to answer, and it's one that underlies a lot of the technology that's, that's developed. And I, I'm not gonna propose that we have an answer for this now, but that it is important to the, um, to the development of technologies for learning. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give sort of a, a broad brush overview of the kinds of advanced learning technology, again, technologies that use, typically use AI and, and machine learning for, for supporting student learning. And there are three categories that I'm gonna talk about today. One is um, individual learning, um, so one-on-one -on -one between the human and the computer learning. Second one is technologies that help in collaboration and help in, in group learning. And then finally, a relatively new technology that I've been involved in and am really excited about, which is called classroom orchestration, which is where you have technology that supports not just the student, but supports the teacher. So if the students are using technology in the classroom, you want the teacher to be able to know what, what's happening with the students, how they're progressing, and to provide um, learning analytics and, and, and data for the teacher to be able to help uh, their students. And I'll give you an example, very interesting example of how, what we're doing in that, in that area. Okay, so with respect to individual learning, intelligent tutoring systems have been around for quite a while. And as I say, one of the key things that, that, that they do is they track what students know and they try to provide adaptive help to the students and adapt, adaptive help in a number of different ways. So pre presenting tasks to the students that are at their right level of knowledge at their zone of proximal development, you could think of it as. And um, they also typically provide hints that are, are context-sensitive, that are sensitive to where they are in, let's say, problem solving in a math or a science um, domain. And they also um, typically have built into them the knowledge of typical errors that, that students will make and providing feedback that's appropriate to those, to those errors and supportive of those errors. Probably the most well-known technology is uh, the Algebra Cognitive Tutor, which was first developed at Carnegie Mellon University by John Anderson and colleagues, but has now been spun off as a company um, by the name of Carnegie Learning, and I'll talk a little bit about that. That's probably been the biggest success story when it comes to intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, another example is the Andes um, Tutor, Kurt Van Lane. Uh, has developed this. Um, it's a college physics tutor. It's meant to, not to replace classwork, but to provide homework um, support for students. Another example is a genetics tutor um, that was uh, developed as a, sort of part of a, bio, a biology course. Again, more as a sort of a homework um, as, as opposed to replacing anything that the instructor would do. And then finally, another example is the SQL Tutor that was developed um, by a colleague of mine in New Zealand, uh, Tanya Mitrovic, which is help, helps students learn about the language SQL, which is um, for accessing databases. And this is just sort of a sampling of some of the tutoring systems that have been around for a while and have been through many studies um, that have shown their, their benefits for learning. Uh, again, I'm gonna focus a little more on the cognitive algebra cognitive tutor because this is the a tutor that's had the most real world success. Um, Obviously, it's for, it's for learning algebra. This is an example of a screenshot of um, what the cognitive tutor um, presents to students. And uh, here is a, a, a summary of a study that was done, a large-scale study, as you can see, um, in, the U, in the U.S. across seven different states and 17,000 students. Um, uh, th they were able to show that the, tu the tutor improved um, learning by uh, eight percentile points compared to a control group. And as you can see on the slide, was about, is about the same as doubling math learning in a year for, for a high school student. Um, and this is, this is a tutor that's used widely in North America and Canada and in the United States for high school students. Um, there are also many other tutoring systems um, it's the, again, this is probably the most established area and certainly the area that has shown the most benefits in terms of empirical evidence. And here are just a couple examples of some other tutors from um, colleagues of mine that have done, done work in this area. Some of the directions that people are going in, in this particular area, again, just to give you a flavor, is um, one relatively new area is to try to identify um, and adapt to affect. So uh, to adapt not only to the knowledge that students have, 
but also to affective states such as um, confusion or frustration, boredom, whether they're, um, they're just what we call gaming the system where they're just playing with the tutor but they're not really trying to make an honest effort to learn. And machine learning techniques are used to develop um, what are called detectors to help us identify these states to provide feedback to students. There's also been work that's been done to identify and adapt to metacognitive states. I was involved in a project um, called the HELP Tutor where what we did there is we added to a geometry tutor um, a model of, of the student and their metacognition, in particular their help seeking and whether or not they were asking help appropriately or not. Okay, so um, another area of individual learning is educational games. I'm sure many of you have, have run across this. And the idea behind, uh, the practical idea behind educational games is that students spend a lot more time outside of school than they do in. And a lot of it, as you know, is, is spent playing video games, especially, you know, we're talking now K-12 students, and particularly up to about eighth grade. Um, video gaming is, is very common. So what you would like to be able to do is you'd like to leverage some of that time that they're playing games for, for um, not just for pleasure, but, but to provide learning um, potential uh, as well. And that's the idea behind educational games. And I'll give you a couple examples of educational games that have been developed. One is this game called Zombie Division. The idea is that you have these zombies that are coming to you, you're the, you're the player and you're shooting the zombies and the weapons that you have are whole numbers and you have to shoot the zombies that um, where, where you have the right whole number division. So if you have a weapon that has a two and a zombie comes at you that's a four, then that's a score if you, if you hit that zombie. So this is an example of the kind of game that you know, we know that young people play, but actually building into the game mechanic the learning of, um, of, of something that's really important, very fundamental mathematic, um, mathematics. And a study that was done with this particular game showed that when the me game mechanic was tightly connected, as I just described, to the actual division, that is having the weapons be numbered and the zombies be numbered, the students um, did much better on a post-test and even better on a delayed post-test as compared to a condition where the mechanic and the, and the actual content were not tightly integrated and in a control condition where there was no division at all. Okay, so it, it just is a sort of an example of how important it is if you're gonna provide educational games that you really figure out the right design space to combine the game and the, um, and the content. Here's a game that um, was developed in my lab um, which we call Decimal Point. It's essentially an amusement um, park metaphor. Fifth and sixth grade students play this game. They play a series of what are called mini games where they learn things like place value, comparing decimal magnitude, um, and so on. And the game is, is designed, I heard uh, a talk this morning about looking at particular misconceptions that, um, that students have, and that's how this game is designed. So for instance, games that, are, that focus on the misconception that longer decimals are larger which is very commonly um, held misconception by students because they typically have learned whole numbers before they've learned decimals. And there's a variety of these, what we call mini games that, that are used inside this and they do things like sequencing the decimals, um, placing a decimal on a number line, that's what's done here, but they do it by having a, the player kick, kick a ball into a, a soccer net. And, and here's an, an addition problem with, with the game. And what we were able to show with this game is in comparison to um, a, a, another um, technology, in fact, an intelligent tutoring system that did, was not game-like, that the students actually learn better with, with the game in this case. And in particular, lower prior knowledge students benefited more and females benefited more. Um, and this is important, we think, because game development in the educational space is really most important for students who struggle because they're the students who probably need something like um, a game to, um, to support their, um, their learning and to motivate them. This is one of the few rigorous studies um, in, the, um, in, in the math area where educational games have been shown, again, in comparison to a control condition to be beneficial. Okay, so the next area I want to talk about is collaborative learning and in particular com computer-supported collaborative learning, which is a, a, a research subfield within learning science. And this particular um, field builds on, on the idea of constructivism, um, which is where students develop their own 
understanding and they work together and they sort of co-construct knowledge essentially. And computers and software are used to help the communication and the working together of the students. Um, a lot of what's focused on in, in what's called CSCL, the abbreviation for this, is the interaction, how students are, are able to interact with one another to learn. A lot of the work that's done here is, is more design-based. It's not hypothesis testing. And a couple of examples here, there's the Y system from uh, Marsha Lin and, and Jim Slada, where essentially it's a platform to support science inquiry activities. Um, and they sort of have a mix of activities that are supported um, with advanced technology, personalized instruction. They give cognitive hints that are in the context of problem solving. Um, they do what's called discussion diagramming, where they collaboratively work together to, um, to argue um, for and against um, conclusions. And again, the students co-construct knowledge. And, and they do things also, um, a, a one aspect of collaborative learning is something called scripting, where you provide sort of this dynamic way of having students either play a role or um, have resources in a way that allows them to work together in, in what's known as the, the jigsaw design in collaborative learning. Um, another uh, collaborative learning technology developed by a colleague of mine at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Carolyn Rose and her students, is what's called conversational agents. So Carolyn is an expert in natural language processing and what she does is she provides these um, software agents that work together with students in the context of problem solving to help them when they get stuck or when they're not collaborating with one another, when they're not talking to one another. And basically she's been able to show with this system VMT Basilica um, that stu students learn up to um, 1.25 standard deviations more when they get this interaction support with conversational agents. The final area that I wanted to um, briefly talk about is what's called classroom orchestration. This is again a relatively new technology area and the idea here is that in a traditional classroom the teacher's role is to um, you know, lecture to the students and so on but it's moving more and more towards um, being uh, guides on the side as I say here in, in this slide here. And um, <clears throat> educational technology is taking a more um, prominent role in this context, and I'll give you a couple examples of some systems, including one that, that um, I'm working on with a student at CMU and a colleague of mine, Vincent Alevin, called Lumalo. And the idea of Lumalo, um, it's really pretty interesting, is that you have a classroom of students who are working with intelligent tutors, um, and what happens is the teacher wears smart glasses that have augmented reality. So the teacher can look at the classroom, and as you can see in this picture here, if a student is struggling, that'll be indicated by a question mark appearing over that student in their, in their glasses. Um, and they can blink, and they'll, they'll get details of a student as they're looking um, through their glasses at the student. Um, they can look up at the, the board, and you can see in this picture that's the case where they can get sort of an overview of what's going on in the classroom. Um, and believe it or not, this, this idea, even though it's very tech oriented, really it came from teachers that we worked with. Um, uh, Ken Holstein, the, um, the main designer of this, he worked extensively with teachers in the classroom and they even came up with the idea. They didn't, they didn't want to have um, a handheld device that would help them with this. They wanted to be able to have this information to support their students, but they, did, they wanted to be hands free. So it, it was natural to have the glasses where the, all they had to do was look out at, at the students. <clears throat> We just did, did a study that we published in um, our conference last year um, that where we were able to show where a, a, in, a, in a number of classrooms, I think we had on the order of about 300 students involved, so relatively small study, but, but nevertheless what we did is we had um, the teacher wear glasses um, for some of the classes with the learning analytics. In other classes, they just wore the glasses that just gave them information about what the student was doing at that point in time. And then the third condition, they didn't wear glasses. We compared those three conditions and we found that the, the teachers who had the glasses and ha got the analytics, the glasses plus analytics shown here in the slide, they did significantly, their students did significantly better. And the reason for this, and when we dug into the data, was because the teachers were more able to identify who needed help. At, at any point in time. Again, because they had these glasses, they could look around the room and they could see when students needed help. They would get that feedback directly in their glasses and they could, they could help those students. 
there have been other um, uh, examples of classroom orchestration that have been developed. Um, uh, uh, Pierre Dillenberg um, in Switzerland developed this, um, this approach called Lantern, uh, where basically the device that you see there is a device that changes color and changes the way it looks based on where, how students are collaborating in groups in a classroom. So it helps the students communicate amongst themselves about where they stand in problem solving, and it also provides a way for the teacher to see how the students are, are doing. So again, it sort of falls into this model of classroom orchestration because the teacher is able to get this feedback to directly help the students. Uh, another one here, very interesting work that was done in Australia. Um, Martinez Maldonado was the lead on this, where students use this um, large um, uh, smart board where they're working together collaboratively and then the teacher has, a, has an iPad or uh, some sort of a tablet where, where they're getting this feedback of what the students are doing, which is really valuable. Again, when, when you've got a large uh, classroom of students who are working with technology, it's not easy to tell what's happening with those students and this provides a dashboard to allow the, the teachers to, to provide feedback. Here's another project that I was involved in. It was, it was called Argonaut. Um, this was a, a project where students learned critical reasoning and argumentation, and we developed AI techniques that would allow us to analyze um, as the students were developing these argument graphs. This is an example that you see here, and what's in red is sort of a significant um, part of what the students are doing, and it would provide these, these alerts to the, to the teacher. Again, with the idea being that there wasn't feedback going directly to the students, but rather would go to the teacher, and then the teacher would be equipped then to help help students. Okay, and so what I wanted to do now is sort of, I've gone through a broad brush of the um, technologies, and what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, where the, these technologies stand in terms of how they've demonstrated learning benefits empirically and the sophistication of the technology since we're talking about advanced learning technologies. So for each of the things that I spoke about today, so first of all, intelligent tutors, as I mentioned earlier, have had a lot of studies, a lot of studies have been done that have shown the benefits of intelligent tutors. Um, like they say a lot in, in AI, once, once something's been um, built and been used a long time, we start, we start calling it something other than artificial intelligence. It was originally artificial intelligence, but now people think of it as, as less than that. So that's why I put it a little bit lower on the sophistication um, Educational games, on the other hand, um, have a lot of sophisticated technology, a lot of AI, um, a lot of video graphics and, and so on that are involved, but they're relatively new in terms of um, how much evidence we have that they actually lead to student learning. Um, collaborative learning, there, I, I sort of broke this into two categories. There are some um, collaborative learning systems that act more as sort of um, ways to help students communicate with one another, but don't have a lot of advanced technology, don't have a lot of AI in those. Those have been shown to be beneficial to learning, a little bit less than intelligent tutors, but nevertheless, they have been shown to be beneficial. And then there's technology like the Carolyn Rose project that I talked about, where she, she uses these conversational agents which use natural language processing. And that's a fairly sophisticated technology, but it, it hasn't yet been proven to be uh, fully beneficial. And then classroom orchestration, I said, is very new, so there's, there's less evidence of its, of its benefits, um, but I'm very optimistic, I think, that it's gonna be um, uh, something that's gonna really be rising quite a bit as years go on. And it, there's also quite a bit of um, sophistication here, machine learned detectors that are used to do things like identify um, effect, like I mentioned earlier. But the point is, is that there's still lots of room for success in that sort of upper quadrant here. Um, where we have more evidence that, that these technologies are really leading to student learning and that we're also um, employing um, advanced technologies to the fullest. So uh, to conclude, um, I would just like to, just a few comments. Learning science, I think, is definitely helping. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's really the basis for all the work that we do in developing advanced learning technologies. Um, we use this to guide both the development of the technologies, but also to evaluate and validate the technologies. Um, but, but admittedly, there's been more success in research and less in real world classrooms. I, I gave the example of, of the Carnegie Learning Cognitive Tutors. M almost certainly the most um, successful tutoring advanced technology that we, we've shown in real world classrooms. A number of the other studies that I spoke about um, have been done in schools, but, but they haven't been done 
through like a, an entire year, and so there's sort of less evidence of, of their long-term success. And where I see things going is that I think um, with the various technologies that are emerging, I, I showed you an example of how augmented reality is being used in a classroom. Um, I'm working on another project at the moment where we were trying to provide uh, learning through virtual reality. I think that's going that's certainly a, on, on the rise for education. Um, there's also novel use of haptic devices. And then there's also going to probably be a, like a combination of these technologies as, as we move forward. Um, one thing that may be obvious is that um, as academics working in a university, we're not necessarily the best equipped to spin off these technologies directly to schools, but rather it makes more sense to have um, companies that, that um, are software focused and are able to turn, um, turn the technologies into something that's real that can be used out in, um, in real classrooms. Um, so I, and I definitely see um, a future where we, where, where we do have artificial intelligence in the classroom um, quite a bit. But I think the, you know, as I say, the, the idea of the companies um, being the ones that actually make that happen is an, is an important aspect. So I thank you for your attention.